Well, greetings future social workers and welcome back to Case Management 535. Uh, thank you for joining me this week for our lecture. Uh, today I'm excited about what we're going to be discussing um, for this week's content uh, related to case management. So we will go ahead and jump into it. This week for our lecture, I'm excited to be able to continue to discuss part two of our engagement and assessment process related to the general interventionist model or GEM. Um, and particularly what we're gonna do is continue with your uh, overview training of wraparound. And what we're gonna do is discuss in particular the engagement phase of wraparound. So just as a refresher and reminder, when we say that we are in the engagement phase of wraparound, that aligns with phase one of the generalist intervention model of engagement and assessment, okay? So that's where we're gonna leave off today. So our structure for today's uh, lesson will be the same as always, and today we'll be unpacking uh, particularly two topics related to what we do as case managers when we engage in the, uh, or begin the engagement phase in case management. So today we're gonna to talk particularly about strengths identification, and we're also going to talk about safety planning. These are two important areas that you are going to be doing as a social worker when you begin your case management work, okay? So we'll go ahead and discuss those first. So, um, strengths identification. So, some of you may be saying, well, that seems kind of obvious. We want to be strength-based in our approach as social workers. We should honor the strengths of our clients. And that is true, that we want to do all of those things. In wraparound, we say that wraparound is a strength-based needs-driven process. And if you remember from previous lectures, we talk about that wraparound is not a service. Wraparound isn't necessarily a strategy. Wraparound is a process. When we engage families, clients in the wraparound process, what we are doing is we're applying a strength-based needs-driven approach. And again, it sounds kind of obvious, and some of you may say, why are we going to take time to lecture on the power of strengths? Why do we need to spend time identifying strengths for our family? Well, there's a few reasons for that. A few powerful reasons that over the years in working with families, I have seen firsthand the power of transformation when we begin to apply case management in a strength-based manner. So in the past, many times when we discuss families, when you see a referral coming across your desk for a family that you are gonna work with or a client that you're gonna work with, they tend to be what we refer to in our field as deficit-based. Oftentimes, families don't enter a system or clients don't enter a system such as child welfare, um, the justice system, um, special education, mental health, because things are going great, right? Oftentimes, clients enter a system for treatment, for case management services, whatever the case is, because there's usually a dysfunction. The problem is that all of the writing, all of the focus becomes deficit-based. It, it drives the discussions about what isn't happening, what is broken with a client or a family, and why do social workers need to fix it? And that can be very problematic for our work that we're doing with our clients. So when we talk about strengths, we're not only talking about strengths in the sense of maintaining a positive attitude and always finding the silver lining in a situation, okay? Strengths, of course, do that, but that's not the primary function, I would argue, of why we take the time to maintain a strength-based, needs-driven approach to our case management. At the core of it, what we're talking about is honoring the clients that we're working with. When we choose to engage in a case management situation with our clients, we cannot do that effectively, okay? We cannot move a client along from a, a point A to point B without honoring the dignity of that client. And in order to do that, we need to begin with strengths. We need to identify strengths. Now, the reason why we wanna do this and we wanna start with strengths is because strengths honor this notion of vulnerability. Now, some of you may be saying, what does this have to do with case management, vulnerability? So many times when we work with clients, what I have found over the years is that clients have read their stories. Many have read their charts. They've been to court hearings. They've heard some of the worst things, the most personal things that have ever been shared about their lives, aired out to people in a courtroom, to multiple workers that have changed over from years to years, to multiple therapists that they've had to tell their story to. And as a result, our clients, vulnerability, okay, has, has dropped. 
clients after hearing the trauma that they've experienced over and over discussed by others after having decisions made for them by social workers and court appointed officials and others are tired of being vulnerable and as a result their armor goes up there is this notion of being defensive that sometimes comes across to us and you'll hear professionals say this that that client is being defensive they're being guarded um, uh, you might even hear the term that our clients are being resistant from time to time and what I would caution us to consider is that we can't see clients as being resistant. Clients have a good reason to be resistant. The, the individuals that we're serving have been marginalized, abused, neglected, traumatized in their lives, okay? They have been oppressed by multiple systems and individuals. And as a result of that, they have to maintain a guarded approach to prevent that pain from happening again. So when one of my case managers tells me that this client is coming across as resistant, I may say they may be a little guarded, they may be protective, they may be hyper vigilant to what we're discussing, but I wouldn't say that they're resistant um, because resistant places it, some of the onus on the client making a decision to actively disengage. Whereas I would argue that that's a defensive mechanism that our clients have learned over the years in order to protect themselves from further harm. So when we begin with strengths, what we're really doing is honoring the vulnerability of our clients. What we're doing is saying that we recognize that there are strengths with the individual or the group, whomever we're working with, and that we see those strengths first. We see the individual as more than a deficit. We see the individuals as more than an impairment of functioning, which is sometimes what you hear. We see the person as a person that comes with their own strengths and successes and we're going to use those strengths to move past those challenges that are presenting in their life this is what i mean by the notion of vulnerability okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to present to you a case study really quickly this is a case summary of a typical sort of summarization that you will receive in a referral when you're first having an individual client come to you and is being referred for you to work with okay now what I'm going to say is I'd like for you as I read through this scenario to kind of consider for a moment, what if this was you and your family? What if this captured, okay, in a chart that other people were reading that we're now going to work with you, uh, the story of your family and how would you feel in this moment? Chances are you're going to feel pretty vulnerable, but your defensive mechanism is going to come up. And so I'd like for us to read through this very common scenario. These, this is a summary of referrals that I have read over and over for 15 years of children and families that I have worked with. And this is the first bit of information that I get to read about a family who is referred to me to work with, okay? So let's look at this summary. Charlie is 12 years old and currently resides in Santa Ana, California. He and his older brother, Lawrence, who is currently 15 years old, live at home with their mother, Maria. Charlie was physically and sexually abused by his stepfather when he was nine years old through the age of 11. By the time Charlie was 10, his behaviors became too difficult to manage, and Charlie was placed in the RCL-12 group home. So that was a level, one of the higher levels in group home care prior to continuum of care reform. Charlie exhibited problematic behaviors, including verbal and physical aggression, defiance towards adults, ran away weekly, and used marijuana via vaping and smoking. After showing some progress in the group home, Charlie was transitioned home to live with his biological mother and older brother. Maria has a history of being involved in violent or abusive relationships, as well as alcohol and cannabis dependency. Maria has been sober for eight months and communicates with her sponsor weekly. Maria stated that her stepfather does not live in the home, but she talks to him from time to time. Maria, Maria also states that she does not want any services to be in the home, nor does she wish for people to come in and tell her how to parent her children. She's completed a set of court-ordered parenting classes and states she has everything under control. Maria works multiple jobs and wants her son to get an education so they don't end up like their father who left when they were, when they were born. She calls the school every day to see if her sons have attended first period. Charlie does not attend school regularly. However, when he does attend, he usually receives detention or is suspended. Charlie will at times ditch all classes except for physical education and English. He states that his teachers in those courses get him and don't piss him off. When Charlie is in detention or is suspended, it's usually for joking during class, and when the teacher confronts his behaviors, he becomes verbally aggressive and defiant. 
Charlie argues, argues with his mom regularly and often curses at her. He, is, he and his older brother often hang out together and smoke pot. Charlie also skips class to sell um, pot in the neighborhood and was recently placed on informal probation for attempting to hotwire a car and possession of cannabis. At times, Charlie and his brother will run away to an uncle's house to drink and hang out with their friends. Charlie states that he wants to be home and that he's bored in class and hates his school. When at home, Charlie reads car magazines, smokes pot, draws graffiti art on scraps of paper in his room. Charlie states that when he grows up, he wants to be a mechanic like his uncle. So folks, this is a reminder. This is a summary of many cases. No joke, probably a hundred or so cases of children that I've worked with over the years who have similar stories to tell about trauma, of, of neglect and abuse. Now, consider this summary here was provided by a social worker and written in order for the social worker to be able to submit a referral for consideration to wraparound. So by the time I receive this referral, I know one, that I'm working with the family, and two, I know the reasons why they were referred. Here's the thing, anything that's documented in your chart though, the family may have access to later on down the road. So it's not entirely impossible that at some point down the road, Maria, Charlie, or Lawrence may find themselves reading this very summary about their family. Now let's put our, our, our selves in the shoes of the family. If you were reading this about your own family, how would this make you feel? How would this make you feel knowing, okay, that social workers had already read this and are ready to show up to your home? What might be going through your head about the judgments that I might make about Maria, about her family as a result of this summer? So when we talk about vulnerability and we would talk about strengths, honoring vulnerability, let's talk about what's not honored in this case, right? I'd like to show you a quick video. It's three minutes long from an interview from Brene Brown. And I don't know if many of you have heard of Brene Brown. Brene Brown's a researcher, a uh, social worker who does research on vulnerability and empathy in particular. Brene Brown's talks are amazing and I would encourage you to check out many. And so I may reference some of those from time to time in my lectures. Brene Brown in this interview is going to talk about the notion of vulnerability. She's going to talk about what it means to be vulnerable. She's going to talk about what it means when we are vulnerable and we prevent ourselves, allowing ourselves from being vulnerable. Over years and years of being in the system, our clients are going to have learned how to prevent themselves from being vulnerable. They're going to put up walls to protect themselves emotionally. And those walls are going to manifest themselves. They're going to look like defiance and anger and dodging your services when you go showing up as a social worker to work with them, okay? So let's watch this really quick video from Brene Brown on vulnerability, and let's return to this strength summary afterwards, okay? This first video, I'm sorry, is a minute long. The next video I'm gonna show you is three minutes long. Sorry about that. Spiritual culture, I think, is best understood with a simple question of never enough. Never good enough, certain enough, perfect enough, relevant enough, never extraordinary enough. So what we do in response to scarcity culture, I think all of us every day, we wake up in the morning and we armor up. And in doing so, I can protect myself against the things that hurt the most. Judgment, criticism, fear, blame, ridicule. I'm going to armor up. I think the troublesome thing about doing this is that it doesn't really safeguard us from pain, but it does prevent us from accessing the things that vulnerability takes us to. Vulnerability is the path to love, belonging, joy, intimacy, trust innovation and creativity. But I would argue one of the greatest casualties of invulnerability is this, empathy. Okay, so here's what I want to discuss. Let me go ahead and pause this and we'll leave this video for a moment. If you notice, one of the important things to consider in vulnerability is this, this armoring up mentality, right? And this is something that Brene Brown was talking about when she was discussing this notion of vulnerability, of resisting vulnerability when we're human beings. Over the years, our families, our clients that we are going to serve have built calluses as a result of being, just as uh, Dr. Brene Brown had said, 
of, of feeling this sense of inadequacy, of never feeling smart enough, good enough, right? Over the years, professionals, as well as personal people in their lives, have assigned blame, have ridiculed them, have judged them, and have criticized them, either for their parenting, their life choices, their relationships, what they've done or what they've failed to do. And as a result of that, our clients are going to armor up. Every time one of our clients reads a story like this, they're going to have to armor up. They're going to be concerned about what we are gonna to bring to their doorstep when we come to work with them. And so if you notice, this isn't extremely negative, this, this story that we're reading here. But if you also notice, it's not extremely positive either. And it's written from the perspective of an outsider looking in, right? And so your task as a social worker and as a wraparound practitioner, if you're on a wraparound team, is to identify the strengths of this family before you even meet them. This is the biggest challenge at first for new individuals who are implementing wraparound, is to adopt a full-blown strength-based approach to services. So my challenge to you, the same way I would if you worked for me in an agency and I was training you in wrap, is my next question would you to be is please list 10 strengths for this family. So what I would like you to do for a moment, okay, is take five, 10 minutes, okay? You can put me on pause in a couple of seconds here, take five or 10 minutes, and what I would like you to do is generate a list of strengths, at least 10 for this family. Now what I'm gonna do is after you're done with that, you can compare your list with some of the strengths that I came up with, and you're going only off of this scenario here, okay? So let's go ahead and you go ahead and generate your strengths, go ahead and put me on pause for a few minutes while you do that, and when you're done, come on back to this recording. Okay, if you're returning from the recording, that means you went ahead and put me on pause for a minute, you've generated your strengths list, and now we're gonna compare what strengths that we came up with with this family, right? So again, I was asking you for at least 10 strengths that you can identify in working with this family. So let's take a look. Now, in our first wraparound meeting with the family, we wanna have these strengths list handy because we are gonna engage in a strength building activity with the family. If you notice down here on the side, there's some big post-its. These are those giant post-its that you carry kind of like an easel. So you notice the easel that's set up here and they remove. So you can tear them off and you can stick them on a wall. And if you notice, there are some markers here. In wraparound, you can always tell a facilitator, facilitator that's walking around because they're going to have this board up, this easel, in addition to some markers. Over the years, I've carried in the back of my car stacks of those post-its and markers because I knew I was going to be facilitating what we call the initial family team meeting. So in this initial family team meeting, what you're doing is you would have invited as a RAP facilitator or social worker, everyone that we have identified that can potentially be a team member with this family, that loves and cares for this family, that the family wants to have them there, and you're saying, let's all get together so we can talk about a plan with our family, okay? And what you're gonna do is you are gonna start before doing anything else, after you take attendance and you see who's there and you say hello to everyone, what we wanna do is we are going to start generating strengths lists for the family. And so we would put a post-it up and we would write Maria's name on there. We would put a post-it up and we would write Charlie's name. We would put a post-it up and we would write um, Lauren's name. We would put a post-it up, we put the uncle up. And we would do that for every single team member present, even our, um, even our professionals, such as a social worker, behavioral specialist, clinician, or whomever is on that team. And what we're gonna do is generate strengths for every single member of the team. Now, let me go ahead and show you in an initial family team meeting, here are some of the strengths that I would have generated for this family based off of that initial referral. Okay, so for Charlie, I have a list of behaviors here, or uh, strengths here, such as his behaviors improved in his residential setting. That's a success, that's a positive thing. Charlie wants to be home with his family. He loves his mother, he loves his brother and uncle, right? Charlie is athletic, he loves going to, um, to PE while he's in class. He's artistic, he draws, right? He attends English class regularly. Now, do you notice when we're framing strengths, we don't say that Charlie misses all his other classes. We know that, we acknowledge that, obviously that's something to work on. But in a strength-based approach, we're saying Charlie attends his English class regularly. That's something that he still does because he has that relationship with the teacher. Charlie has a sense of humor. Charlie is an entrepreneur. That's another way of saying, right, that he was smoking 
and selling pot in the neighborhood? Well, Charlie wants to earn a little cash. What we need to do is begin to teach him positive ways, right, legal ways of earning money, right? So that's something we need to address. Charlie is resourceful and he has a career goal in mind. These are all strengths that are reframed based on the information that we got, that we're sharing with the family. Now, mom, let's look at some strengths for mom. Sorry, I'm gonna breeze through so we have the list fully here. Okay, uh, mom is sober for eight months. She's contacts, he contacts her sponsor. She's completed her parenting classes, right? So notice I'm not focusing on the fact that she's resistant to individuals coming in her home. I'm focusing on the strength that she completed her parenting classes. She's a hard worker, right? She works three jobs. She's persistent. She is clear in what she wants for her and her family. She's independent right now. She, she left the relationship that she was in. She's a good provider. She loves her children. She wants the best for her sons. She maintains frequent contact with the school. And I would point things out to make mom feel like we see the strengths in her, right? Something like that she has a big smile and also that she has church contacts individuals in, the, in her faith-based community who she's connected with. So mom, Maria, is a believer, okay? So now picture again, you're sitting in this meeting, you're Maria, you're Charlie, and you're feeling awful, right, about the potential of what we have read as the professionals stepping into the home. Imagine how this is going to feel for the professionals on the team to begin to see these strengths in you and your family. Let's continue on with the other uh, members of the team. Let's go with Lawrence's brother and his uncle. Lawrence, similar to Charlie, loves his mother, brother, and uncle. Char uh, Lawrence is a leader, right? He's an influence on Charlie. Lawrence himself is an entrepreneur and is resourceful. And I may pick something about Lawrence and his sense of humor, something maybe like charismatic or something like that, okay? Uncle, in this case, his behaviors, um, I'm sorry, I, I actually, we should exit this one because uncle was not in residential. Sorry, I was building off of my previous list. No, uncle was not in a group home, at least not in his history was it disclosed. So we'll leave that one off. Um, he wants to, his sister's family to stay together. He wants to be a role model for his nephews. He loves his sister nephews. Um, he can fix anything, is a hard worker and is dependable. So listen, this is the important thing to take, and I, I, I am, I am uh, completely serious in, in what I've said this in my experience. Over the years and years of doing wraparound, I've had the privilege of entering families' homes and breaking down strengths lists for every single family member that's working with our team. And in that time, I kid you not, that I have seen frequently families, Maria, Charlie, Lawrence, and Uncle begin to cry as we are doing the strengths list because I've literally heard from families say, this is the first time that I've ever heard a professional say something positive about me or my family. This is the first time sometimes that individuals have heard each other say anything positive about themselves, especially in families where there's been a tremendous amount of chaos and trauma going on in the home. So one of the things that I would also do when building this list is not only ask my professional team to share the strengths that they've seen with the family based on the referral, but what I would do is ask Lawrence to share a strength about his mother, to share a strength about his uncle, and I would ask the team members to share the strengths about one another, okay? This is a powerful exercise that allows our clients to break down that armor, to take it off and allow themselves to be vulnerable with us. This is important because it, it's essential to building rapport with the family. So remember what I said, case manage management isn't only about the tasks of honoring and creating strengths lists, it's about how you go about doing the work, honoring the dignity of the family, okay? So now, what happens is after you've done these strengths lists, the job of a wraparound facilitator is now to go back to the office. You're gonna sit in your cubicle and what you're gonna do is you're going to build, okay, a strengths story. What you're going to do is take, let me go back to this, sorry, this original referral summary. And what you're gonna do is you're going to reframe the story and tell the story again from a strength-based perspective. And then what you're gonna do is then you take that story back and you read that story to the family about now how, based on the strengths that you see in this family, how you see this family, okay, from a strength-based perspective. You rewrite this story here. This is the beginning of reestablishing a narrative, and this is therapeutic for many families that we're working with because they are now beginning to see themselves not only as victims of judgment 
blame and criticism, but they're beginning to see hope in the same story that's been told over and over. So before we do that, I'd like to show you one more video. This is a three minute video from Brene Brown, okay, discussing the paradox of vulnerability, discussing this notion of when we are able to bring our clients from a place of guardedness to vulnerability, the progress that can be made. So before we read this reframe strength summary, let us go ahead and watch this brief video from Dr. Brene Brown. Okay, here we go. Feeling vulnerable, imperfect, and afraid is human. It's when we lose our capacity to hold space for these struggles that we become dangerous. And it seemed to me that that's one way to describe what is happening in our culture and our political life. We have no space to be honest about that, to be vulnerable, to be imperfect and afraid together, and it's become dangerous. Now, we don't, you know, on a micro level as individuals, we're not our best selves in fear, and collectively, we're certainly not our best selves when we're in fear. I'm thinking we've grown weary of that. I think we're sick of being afraid. And I think there's a silent, a growing silent majority of people who are really kind of thinking at a very basic human level, I don't want to spend my days like this. I don't want to spend every ounce of energy I have ducking and weaving. Mm -hmm. I don't know where we'll go next, but I really believe with every fiber of my professional and personal self that we won't move forward without some honest conversations about who we are when we're in fear and what we're capable of doing to each other when we're afraid. Mm -hmm. It's not just that the things that go wrong for us are part of our wholeness, right, as you described, the, the vulnerability is what makes us, keeps us in, but also that what goes wrong for us is part of our gift to the world. It's what en enables us to connect and be compassionate. And I mean, that's a lovely way to think about, you know, the hard, possibly excruciating upside of the fact that so many of us are struggling and suffering right now. I agree 100%. I think it points to maybe one of the, the, the deepest paradoxes about vulnerability, which is when I meet you, vulnerability is the very first thing I try to find in you. And it's the very last thing I want to show you in me. Mm. Because it's the glue that holds connection together. It's, it's all about our common humanity. Mm -hmm. And when we own our stories and we share our stories with one another and we see ourselves reflected back in the stories of people in our lives, we know we're not alone. And to me, that's the heart of wholeheartedness. It's the, it's the center of spirituality. To me, that's the nature of connection. To be able to see myself and, and hear myself and learn more about myself in the stories you tell about your experiences. Okay, I hope you found that useful. So I know we were gonna talk about strengths and talking about case management. Some of you were saying, how is it that we end up talking about vulnerability and connection, right? And that's because ultimately we're social workers first, right? We are social, social workers, right? We know that there's a the work to be done, but we need to do it in a way that creates connectedness with the clients that we are serving. And so ultimately what Brene Brown was saying in this is that ultimately vulnerability all right, is this notion of allowing ourselves to be connected to one another, to see something similar across the person next to us and say that we are humanly connected, all right, that it's not foreign to us that, yes, you're a social worker and you're coming in with letters behind your name, but I hope what you're doing is honoring the dignity of my family, realizing that we know we haven't done things perfectly. We know that we've messed up, obviously, because we're involved in a system. But what I don't need is for my social worker to sit here and berate me and judge me and tell me how I've messed up, right? But instead to maybe say, to provide a little hope and say that I have some ideas on how we can make things better, okay? And so let's look at this rewritten story. So this would be an example of how I would have to rewrite a story and reframe it from a strength-based mentality based off that first summary of Maria's family, okay? So let's read this story together and now consider then based off the strengths that we've identified with Maria and her family, how would it feel now 
for your social worker to come back into your living room and say, I've had an opportunity to read your referral and I've had an opportunity to review our strengths as a team. After having done so, I want to reframe the story and I want to see it from a different perspective. Let me share the story with you, Maria, okay? Charlie, Lawrence, and Maria are a loving family who reside in Santa Ana, California. Charlie, 12, and Lawrence, 15, are bright, energetic, devoted brothers. They enjoy spending time together, dreaming of the future, and visiting their uncle. Maria is a hardworking single mother who cares for her sons deeply, wants the best for them, and hopes they earn an education that will provide them with opportunities for a successful future. Maria is resilient and is a survivor. She works hard to, pro to provide for her sons, maintain a safe and loving home, and looks out for their education. For the past eight months, Maria has maintained her sobriety, keeps close contact with her sponsor, and attends church regularly. She and her brother have a loving relationship, and her brother, uh, a hardworking mechanic, watches the boys from time to time when Maria is working. Maria and her family love being together. They each are dedicated to improving their communication, maintaining their sobriety, and spending more quality time together. Maria has stated she will continue to attend meetings, maintain her sobriety, and implement the parenting skills she has learned. Charlie stated he will continue to connect with his therapist, is searching for healthy ways to express his feelings, and will try to stay in school longer each week. Lawrence wants to be a positive force in Charlie's life and states that he is going to find new friends who will help he and Charlie stay out of trouble and have a future. So if you notice here, all right, there's a reality to this. We know that everything's not perfect with the family. And, and what Brene Brown would challenge us to consider is, we know that others are imperfect. When do we take the time to acknowledge our own imperfections? So yes, we're working with this family because they've come across hard times. If we are allowing ourselves to be vulnerable with the family and with ourselves, we should also probably acknowledge that things aren't perfect in our own families either, right? And so we wouldn't want others judging our families based on every wrong thing that we've ever done and telling a story from a deficit-based um, perspective. We know that the reality of our system is in order for us as social workers to seek advocacy and resources for our family, we have to mention the difficult stuff. We have to talk about the bad stuff. But that doesn't also mean that we can come back to the family later and say, but let me tell you the strengths. Let me see where I see that you are resilient and connected as a family. Let me share, share with you some of the milestones that you have already crossed as a family who is healing together. And this is how we can reframe a story from a strength-based perspective. So I hope that you found that useful. As a social worker and as a RAP practitioner, part of your job will be to maintain that strength-based perspective and to be able to reframe some of the negativity and the trauma that's experienced in a family's life and reframe it for a positive, okay? So that's that strength-based story and activity that I wanted to share with you. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to close out today's lesson with safety, excuse me, safety planning, okay? So let's talk about safety planning. I'm going to use an analogy here of California, all right, regarded safety planning. So in the engagement phase of wraparound, or what we refer to as engagement and assessment in gym, part of your responsibility is to begin with safety planning you are actually going to be responsible for developing a safety plan with the family to talk about what do we do if some of the challenges that led to our journey to this place today of receiving services and support, okay? What if those things were to happen again? Now, that sounds kind of simple. It sounds like a conversation you can have with a lot of families. The reality is in the course of my time working with children and families, that hasn't always been the case. Safety planning, safety in general, has been a difficult issue for many families to discuss. And the reason for that is because, remember, we're now moving away from that vulnerable piece. Families know that we know some of the trauma, all the child abuse reports that ever been filed, any time that we filed for governmental assistance or all of those other resources, they know that we know that. And as a result of that, the armoring up persona occurs, okay? So families may want to, at first, sort of minimize or at times downplay the level of crisis that may be going on in their home. Again, we cannot assume that this is because clients want to be resistant. We want to assume that they are guarding themselves, protecting themselves 
from future criticism, blame, or shame, okay? So as a result of that, that's what we want to be careful about. And so many times what will happen is I'll say, okay, what I'd like to be able to do now is move into our discussion of safety planning. And what I want to do is generate a safety plan for us as a team so we can respond should we ever have the need in order to make sure that everyone's safe. Many times, either the parents or the child or the client that I'm working with will say, well, you know what, I don't know if we really need to engage in safety planning because things have been pretty okay for the last month. Or you know what, things have gotten so much better and Charlie's behaving great that I, I don't know if we really need to go there anymore. Or they may say, uncle may say, you know what, I don't even know if we need to discuss um, um, safety because you know what, Charlie's been running away less and we know where he is now when he runs away, he comes to me. So at times I found that this analogy works, okay, for being able to introduce the discussion of safety with the clients that you're working with, okay, and why we're generating a safety plan. So I wanna pass along this little tip to you, so hopefully in your careers you can utilize this as well to help break through that barrier of guardedness, okay, of protection when you have to talk about safety planning with a family. So. I love California. We all live in California. Many of us love living in California because we have sun, right? And we, we are, when there's no traffic, about an hour away from everything, right? So we can go to the mountains, we can go to the ocean, we can go to the desert, we can go to the city, right? So we love living in California. But we also know that California has what in terms of our natural disasters? California has earthquakes, right? California has earthquakes. And unfortunately, one of the things that we've learned about earthquakes is we don't get a lot of notice when they're happening. They're pretty unpredictable. And so what we've learned about earthquakes is, is that we have to plan around earthquakes. And so what do we do? What we're encouraged to do when we are Californians? We are encouraged to have the earthquake earthquake preparedness kit, preparedness kit, right? So we're encouraged to have water, jugs of water in our home and food and lighting should we ever encounter an earthquake in our home. We're encouraged to have a safety kit, a first aid kit, and walking shoes in our car should we ever have to travel long distances as a result of an earthquake while we're on the highway, right? And so we know that when we live in California, even though an earthquake may never happen, right? In the next 50 years or whatever the case is, we know that we still have to be prepared should an earthquake strike. Similar in safety planning, that's what we're doing. What I share with the family is I'll let them know, hey, we may never need this safety plan, right? Hey, we may never, and I hope to God that we don't, ever need to utilize a safety plan because that would mean that things are going phenomenally well for your family. But just like an earthquake, we want to have a kit, a plan in place, should we ever need it, okay? Because it's better to be caught prepared than unprepared, especially when it comes to matters of safety. So I say to them, let's build this safety plan together, okay? Now, after 15 years of providing the case management to families, here is what I found. And again, here's what I want to remind you. So your safety plan template the plan, the form, the paper that you use to complete your safety plan for your client or for your family, whomever you're working with, is gonna look different from agency to agency. It's gonna look different from public to private provider, but you're still gonna have the task of safety planning, okay? So let's not get too worried or caught up on what the form looks like. Let's talk about the big picture of what it takes to generate an effective safety plan, okay? And so here's a list on the left-hand side of uh, attributes to include in your safety plan. And these are tips that I'm gonna give you after working 15 years and providing safety planning for the clients that I've worked with. A safety plan is what may or can happen while a family or client is in your care. So even though you haven't seen, let's just say a, a necessarily a runaway episode in the past three months, okay, of a client running away, but it's documented in your referral that the, the client has a history of running away, you will include it on your safety plan. Again, when you explain to the family, it's like an earthquake. It may never happen again. God forbid that it does, right? But at the same time, we want to be prepared just in case it does. And so it's going to end up on the safety plan. It includes a history of past crises, concerns, as well as potential risks. So you've got to think backwards in terms of what has happened in the past that may jeopardize the safety of the individual or individuals I'm working with and all right, what are the potential risks that may propose themselves in the future? It requires practicing and rehearsing. So folks, this is some of the fun stuff that I've been able to do with RAP, is when we build a safety plan, I will literally sketch out scenarios. We will role play the safety plan together. 
And so if one of the kiddos likes to tantrum when he comes home from a visit or whatever the case is, and bio mom doesn't know what to do, then what happens is we literally have a meeting where we role play that safety concern. And what we do is we say, here's the stage, mom, you're gonna be in the kitchen cooking dinner because that's where you are roughly when, you know, son comes home from his visitation. And son, you're gonna walk through the door and you're gonna be upset. What do you do when you're upset? And he says, well, I stomp my hands. I, I curl my fists up, I stomp my feet, and I curl my fists, and I curse. And I'm going to say, so you're going to come in, and you're going to do the exact same thing. And the family's looking at me, and they're like, are you crazy? We're going to do that. I said, we're going to do it. Just like we do an evacuation plan, just like we do an earthquake plan, we are going to rehearse all right, this crisis so that we know what to do in that moment. And we play this out. And believe it or not, it lightens the mood because the family start to understand how ridiculous sometimes this can seem from the outside when the kiddo has to come in pacing and upset and trying to come up with a curse word when he's not mad, all right, in order to think about this. Um, a safety plan should be posted in the house and on the caregiver's person. So I've worked with families over the years where kiddos tend to have a habit of locking their parents out of the house. And so what has happened is we've laminated the safety plan card for the family and we've had to have it in their back pocket. In particular, this is also important for uh, relationships in, in which women may be in uh, violent relationships or individuals are involved in intimate partner violence. So maybe it's not a woman or maybe it's another person who is involved with a partner who is violent towards them. It's important to have a safety plan on their person with numbers they can call at any given time should the scenario arise for them to get away. There should be a list of who responds, how they respond, and when. You want to be as specific as possible, and you also want to include contact information for both your informal and formal supports. These last two in particular are really important. So let me share with you one quick story, and this will close out our lecture for today. When I was a new case manager, I thought that I was doing a great safety plan course, right? I'm like, I'm fresh out of school. I got the safety planning down, right? I took case management 535, whatever the case was. Well, here's something that I learned. Okay, my safety plans talked about a lot of what ifs, but they didn't have a lot of the specifics about who should respond, when they should respond, and what they should do. It was very general. And so here's what happened for the first six months of working with a particular family when I was new as a social worker. What would happen was Sunday mornings at around 11 a.m., my phone started to ring. And it was the dad of a particular family that said that his son was acting up and he was trying to calm him down, and he didn't know what to do. And so what happened being an amazing social worker, or at least trying to be a great case manager? I was on the phone with dad for three hours, and on the phone with the son for two and a half hours, trying to calm them down every single Sunday. Every Sunday like clockwork. Until one day, my supervisor just quietly was kind of looking at me, explaining this, and she says, you know, do you work on Sunday? And I said, well, I'm not supposed to. She says, I, I realize you're not supposed to, but what are you doing all day Sunday? I said, well, I'm on the phone with his family offering support. He says, could it be that your safety plan isn't clear enough? So instead of trying out the strategies that you would have listed on the safety plan, they're calling you because they don't have all the answers, right? And she asked me, what would the family do in this moment of crisis if you were not here? And I said, okay, I get it now. And what I had to go do was go back, sit down with the family and say, so here's what we're going to do. I missed a step in our safety plan. And as a result of that, you're having a rough Sunday. And as a result of that, I'm on the phone with you on that Sunday, right? What we're going to do is we're going to develop this plan. It's going to have a list of the strategies and actually the words to say. And we're going to practice and rehearse this so that in that moment, okay, you know what to do and to try first with all of your steps. Second, there needs to be a list of informal supports they're going to step in and offer support to you in that moment. Because when I am gone and out of this picture, you're going to need those supports because you won't have a RAP facilitator to call anymore. And at that point, over progressively, over the next couple of weeks, things started to get better to the point where that family didn't need to call me on Sundays. It didn't mean everything was perfect for their Sunday, but it meant that they could begin to handle the crisis that was happening in their home. And that was the notion of promoting self-efficacy with this family, all right? So I hope that that helps you with the safety planning. I hope that you found this lesson today helpful in general. So what I'd like to be able to do is go ahead and close us out with our centering activity, okay? So our centering uh, scripture verse today comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. 
in, a, in this uh, particular scripture verse, Jesus says, when you go, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and to your father who is in secret and you and your father um, who sees in secret will reward you. Okay. And so our word for today will be solitude, solitude. So think about for a moment and everything that's going on in your life, where do you have opportunities to allow God to speak this word of solitude into your life? Where do you allow yourself time to be present with God in each of those moments that pass throughout the day, right? So for the centering activity, let's go ahead and put our hands and feet in a nice comfortable position. Let's go ahead and push out all those worries and those concerns. Let's just engage in a moment of solitude, right, with our creator and spend some time allowing him to speak into our heart. Go ahead and take a nice deep breath, close your eyes, and I'll keep track of the time. Okay, go ahead and open up your eyes, take a nice deep breath, welcome back. So I wanna say thank you so much everyone for tuning in and for, um, for, for joining me for the lecture today. Just a reminder, please check Blackboard for your assignments and your due dates. Please reach out to me with any questions, always happy to respond and connect with you. Please continue to know that I am praying for you, you are doing great, hang in there. And I just wanna to say to y'all with my Bitmoji, thank you very much, all right, have a good one. God bless, and I will talk to you all soon. Thank you.